started, I, we're, we're kind of going backwards to go forwards tonight. Um, Revelation 14, and I, I'm, as I have a lot of slides to try to prepare, so I don't mean to be over repetitive, overly repetitive, but Revelation 14 is, to me, uh, it's, it's repeating what Revelation 7 was explaining. You know, I will tell you that tonight's message is probably, is pretty, it's got a lot of information in it. And if you don't have a real understanding of the Bible, you might leave feeling like, man, why do I even go to that church? Because I don't really understand much of what he said. But I want to encourage you that, you know, if you'll hang around, I mean, you got to give me some time, though. If you'll hang around for a couple of years, I promise you, you'll know yeah. the Bible. Uh, Pretty good. You'll be yeah. learning a lot, and you'll understand it better in, in, in you know a couple of months than you did a couple of months before that. You get the point. And you're going to continue to learn, and, and every night I believe if you'll come with open hearts and an open mind, the Lord will speak, Amen, to your That's heart, true. to your situations, and the things that you're going through. But but one of the things that that I do want to point out is is that chapter seven. We're about to read some of it, and chapter fourteen, or what I would call an interlude. What I'm first went into the seals, the beginning of the tribulation, it's, it, the time frame is, is it's in a succession. In other words, seal one, seal two, seal three, seal four. And this, is, this, this seems to be moving according to a chronologic, or chronologically coherent. Like in other words, they go along one after the other after the other, and they're going in a timely fashion, if that makes sense. Whereas every now and then in the book of Revelation, we stop and we're just given information about a lot of the things that are going to be going on in the last days, but they don't necessarily fit chronologically perfectly within the things that you've already covered in the past and the things that you'll soon to cover in the future. Hopefully that makes sense. Sometimes it's even like a review. So real quick, we've already covered Revelation 7, but let's read some of this chapter here, and I'm just going to remind you of a few things. So it's saying after these things, well, the, 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 these things that John had saw. Now, let, let's just back up a second. OK, so many of you may be familiar with the book of Revelation. Most of you already know that John, the beloved, is what he was called in the gospel that he wrote. He called himself the, he, the one whom Jesus loved. Right. He's the one that wrote the gospel of John. He wrote he wrote the letters, 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, which is towards the end of the New Testament. And he wrote the, the book or the letter about the revelation. So the word revelation means apocalypsis, which means an unveiling or a revealing. And so the word revelation, it's not revelations, we've all said it, but it's the revelation of Jesus Christ. It's the fact that one day Jesus is going to be unveiled for the world to see. You know, I've said that before, but many times... You know, I don't know about you, but if you live your life for Jesus out loud or vocally in the world that you live in, um, then many times people will, you can be persecuted for your faith. I know that people have laughed about me sometimes to my face. They've laughed. I've been laughed about behind my back. I know that people talk and, I, and I'm perfectly fine with that by the grace of God. But what, what I'm trying to say is there's going to be a day when all the laughing is going to stop. I just want you to know that there's going to be a day when Jesus is going to be revealed to the world and the things that that you believed through faith, the whole world is going to see it. That's what the word of God says. Every eye will see him. Behold, he comes in the cloud. Every eye will see him. Every tongue will confess. Every knee is going to bow that Jesus Christ, and they're going to say that Jesus is Lord of all. It's going to become very evident. Okay, so that's what the whole book of Revelation is about. And again, it was written by John the Beloved. And when it was written, he was actually on a prison island called the Isle of Patmos, which was in the Mediterranean Sea. Okay, and the reason he was in prison wasn't for some of the things that I got thrown in detention center for, right? Whenever, I mean, I was just a little kid punk criminal. But, you know, whenever I got locked up, it was because I deserved to be locked up. It was because I was breaking the law, right? Y'all know what I'm talking about? I know many of you have never, never been down that road. So, but nevertheless, that's not why John was in prison. He was in prison for preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. He was being persecuted for the cause of the Lord because the great Roman empire only Nero or the emperor, whoever was the emperor at the time, was to be worshipped as God. And in order for Christians to worship the emperor as God, that means that they had to denounce and turn their back on Jesus. 
And there's, there was a lot of people who were compromising during those times and coming up with different ways to try to get around things, just like Christians do today. They compromise and they try to justify their actions. Wait, everybody, a lot of people do it. But, but the point being is, is this, is that if you were going to take a stand for the Lord during those times, there was great persecution. Okay, So we've been traveling through. We've already gone through the seals. And when he says, after these things, I saw four angels... In chapter in chapters five and six, we started to go through the seals of God, right? We started to go through the seals of God, and we we made a big point whenever we were teaching these things early on that there's a big difference between tribulation and wrath. I want to say that again. There's a big di difference between tribulation and wrath. Tribulation is actually described. The word in the Greek it means it, it, the, the Greek word is Lipsis, but what the word means, it means to be pressed. Kind of like whenever you're under pressure of something. You know, we can be under pressure of a lot of different things, right? You can have, I mean, recently I've been kind of like experiencing some stuff. And you can have, when, and you know, this is an interesting concept. Whenever a man and a woman come together as one, guess what? Each ones have families, right? And if you're not careful, then the families on both sides will try to take that couple and they'll start kind of putting a bunch of pressure on them and it'll start. And you know, one of the things that I had to learn the hard way was say, well, time out. I had to come to the realization that guess what? You're not my boss. You don't tell me what to do. You don't tell me where to go to Christmas anymore. I have a family and I'm a man and I will make my own decision. So I don't do it no more. I got a different way of doing it maybe than you do. But sooner or later, sometimes you just got to tell people that are meddling in your business that it ain't their business no more to be meddling in, period. I don't mean to be rude. I'm just saying you pressuring me. That's what the word tribulation means. It means to be pressed. That's just one little earthly example to describe what pressure can look like, right? That's just one way it can come at you. And so pre tribulation presses. So we try to make a difference between the difference between, we try to make a point between the difference of tribulation and wrath. Wrath is from God. When, when the wrath of God is going to be poured out in the book of Revelation, you're going to know it. Because stars start falling from the sky, the sun starts turning black, the moon starts looking like blood, you know, men are stricken with boils, they get sick, the blood, the water starts turning into blood, it becomes obvious, oh my gosh, the wrath of God has hit the earth now, like the plagues in Egypt, okay? Versus tribulation during the seals, we mentioned that, the seals don't have to be God doing it. Because, and some of the things that we talked about, if you'll remember, were that the first seal was the rider on the white horse. Remember that? In the first seal, the rider on the white horse, the rider on the white horse was the Antichrist. And when that seal was opened up and that rider on the white horse showed up, we understand that Antichrist now shows up on the scene. And then immediately after he shows up, you have wars, you have rumors of wars, you have famine, you have, um, you, you have death from various circumstances, and then you have martyrs, those that take a stand for Jesus Christ begin to be killed off. And then you have seal number six, and that's kind of like the transition from tribulation into wrath because, and we'll talk about it a little bit more. I have a couple of things I'm going to show you tonight. But uh, whenever whenever that sixth seal opens up, there's a great earthquake. And there's uh, the sun becomes dark as sackcloth and the moon turns red like blood. And, and then I believe, at least that's what I tried to share with you, where I believe the rapture takes place. Not, not I'm going to say this real quick. As a matter of fact, any of you that have been that have that have been in church or been in other churches and you've heard people teach on Bible prophecy and you've heard people teach on the book of Revelation, you may have all your life been pre-tribulation, like thought of the rapture as pre-tribulation. Maybe not. I see I already saw one person shaking their head. No. And and so um, but at the but at the same time, I just want you to, to understand. I would encourage you to try to think about the scriptures that you held on to if you had. You see, if that's one of the things about coming to this church. You're not really going to want to come to this church if you don't really want to really learn the Bible or to learn, you know, what the Bible is saying. Amen. Um, because we're really going to dissect the Bible because that's what we're called to do. And we're not called to necessarily appeal to the masses, but we're called to appeal to those 
to disciples. And the word disciple means to be a learner of Christ. So I'm just encouraging you that if you have believed in a pre-tribulation rapture in the past, right now in your mind, I just want you, I'm not saying you got to do it right now, but maybe over the next few days, consider in your heart and in your mind, what are the scriptures that I built that doctrine on? What, what did I learn from the preachers that went before me that I sat under? What did they say about that? Or were we just told to believe that? Because I'm going to show you some spots that I believe in chapter 7 right here and then also in chapter 14 show you something much differently than that. Show you what I would call an interseal. And I know I've already said this and this is, re this is repetitive, but listen, some of this information, it's, it, this is a lot of information. And, and, and one of the reasons why I don't want you to get discouraged if you hear a lot of information, you walk out of here and you feel like you don't know it, anything that I said, is because we're going to be repetitive in nature. That's one of the keys to learning is repetition. All right. And so you're going to hear things more than once. And sooner or later, it's going to start to get inside your spirit, man, if you will allow it. All right. All right. So let's go ahead. And so chapter seven is after the seals have been opened. OK, but it's not before the first trumpet blows. All right. So what I need you to know is, is that seal seven and we're not going to go into it. We're not going to read you a bunch of scripture, but I'm just telling you to, under, to trust me on this. Seal seven, when it's open, actually causes the first trumpet to be blown. And then what I'm going to show you later is I believe that once the first trumpet is blown, the first vial is poured out. We're going to talk about that. Like, in other words, that's another thing. And some of you, I might be already lost you. If I did, it's okay. Don't take a nap. Try to pay attention. I'm not going to keep you. I'm trying not to keep you long. But what I'm trying to say is many times some people believe that, this, that the seals happen and then the trumpets happen. And then the vials happen. I'm trying to tell you tonight, I want to try to show you. And when, tonight's not the night I'm going to try to prove it to you, but I'm going to give you the information so that at least get, you get introduced to the information that the trumpets and the vials are happening concurrently. Trumpet one is blown. I believe I told you all this, that Aaron mentioned it to my wife a while back, that when the trumpet is blown, the vial is poured. It's a cause and effect relationship. Ba -ba! Ba -ba! Okay, you see the trumpets are being blown by the angels and then another angel has a vial. And so I just want you to understand that because any of you that have studied the book of Revelation probably may not have looked at it that way before. All right, so let's go ahead. So the seals have already been opened. Seal seven has not been opened. Trumpet one has not been blown. All right, and here we go. And after these things, I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. And I saw another angel ascending. I want you to see that word ascending. I know I made a big deal about it the last time, but I'm going to make a big deal about it again. Okay, here's the ESV version, ascending. Here is the NASV version, ascending. Here is, I don't use it a lot, but I'm going to do it, the NIV version. Look at this. Then I saw another angel coming up. I'm trying to make a point ascending to ascend means to go up all right and so let's go back to the king james version that we were reading out of all right here we go and i saw another angel ascending from the east having the seal of the living god and he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea now when we fast forward and i'm pretty sure it's revelation chapter 8 we've already been there we've already covered all of so if you're coming in, again, this is a somewhat of a review. When we got to Revelation chapter 8, one of the things that you should remember, it, or I'm going to remind you, trumpet 1 allowed things to happen that caused damage to the earth and to the sea. But right now, it's before trumpet 1 is being blown, and you see this scene in heaven, and God's saying, tell the angels that are on the four corners of the earth. No, that doesn't mean that we have to live on a flat earth. Okay, but because the angels are on the four corners of the earth... Tell them not to blow the wind or not to allow the wrath to start. Don't start destroying the earth and the sea yet because these 144,000 servants have to be sealed in their forehead. Now, look, we don't have really time to preach it and to break it down. But look, the 144,000, many of you already know, but what is their purpose? Their purpose is going to be a, to be a witness for God in the last Three and a half years, that is my belief, in the last three and a half years 
of the last seven year period, which is what we would call the end of the end, the 144,000 that are sealed by God will be witnesses for God and the goodness of God and will continue to proclaim the message of Jesus Christ and what he's already done for the earth. Amen. Many people will be left behind in the rapture. Many people will be left behind in the rapture and many Jewish people who thought that they were okay because they rejected Jesus will have another opportunity to hear the good news of Jesus Christ. So the reason that I want to bring that up to you right now is, is because I want to tell you that even though you and I aren't going to ever be part of the 144,000, right? Because you don't even want to be that. The, now, the Jehovah's Witnesses got a different story, but I'm not going to get into them right now. But listen, what I do want you to know is you do want to be a servant of the Lord. Amen. You do want to be a witness for the Lord Jesus Christ. So God has always had a witness in the land. I think it's important that we remind ourselves of that. He always has had a mouthpiece. People that are willing to live for him and people that are willing to speak for him. People that are willing to take a stand for Jesus Christ. Amen. To be to be saved from death, to be saved from the world. How do I get saved, preacher? Well, you believe that you're a sinner and that you need a savior and you put your faith in Jesus Christ and what he did for you at the cross and you invite him into your heart and you ask forgiveness of your sin. And when you do that and you mean business with God, the Holy Spirit comes to live on the inside of your heart. You will never be the same. Amen. And then from there. Whenever the God opens up the door of opportunity, you begin to live for him and you begin to speak for him and you begin to witness for him. That's what it means to be a witness for God. And he's not going to ever leave this earth without a witness. I don't believe there's always going to be a witness. I believe even in the end, listen, after the last seven year period, after the battle of Armageddon and after during the millennial reign of Christ, there's still going to be a witness for Jesus on the earth. I don't even have time to talk about all that stuff right now. Even after the millennial reign of Christ. The word of God says in the last two chapters of the book of Revelation, they call him the lamb. What I need you to understand is I personally believe he will always bear the nail scars in his hands. He will always bear the wound in his side. What is that? That's a constant reminder. That is a witness upon the earth or the witness of whatever it's going to look like when it's all said and done. That God the Father so loved the mankind that he sent his only begotten son as a lamb, the ultimate lamb, as a sacrifice to pay the penalty of your sin and to pay the penalty of my sin. That should get a hold of you. I'm just saying that should grab a hold of your hearts to understand that the God of glory loves you enough that he would send his son to die for your sin. Amen. To save yeah. you because he loves you. Amen. That's, and that's the love of God. Right. People talk about love all the time. And love has become real fluffy and it's a real feel good love. And, and I like, hey, look, I like to feel good as much as the next guy. But I got to tell you that love that God's love was shown to us in the naked, bloody Savior that hung on the cross. Oh, amen. The world doesn't like to see it because it reminds them of their sin. But listen, as the people of God, as the church of God, you should embrace it. You should love it because I got to tell you, not only does it get you into heaven, my friend, but it'll set you free on earth. Today. Yeah. It'll set you free on earth. Amen. Yeah. So it was given to the earth, the earth and the sea, saying, hurt not the earth and the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. And I heard the number of them which were sealed, and they were 144,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel. Now, I'm not going to read all of this, but if you'll remember, I had a little... On my computer, I was a pop, 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 Judah, Simeon, uh, you know, Manasseh. We went through the, all of them. So 12,000 from each tribe. All right. So I'm, I'm just going to fast forward through that because we're not even teaching Revelation 7. I'm just reminding you that Revelate, I believe Revelation 14, which is where we are tonight, is a repetition. It's repeating the information in Revelation 17. And that's the main point I'm trying to get across to you tonight. Amen. All right, so it says, after this, I beheld and lo, a great multitude. Now, this is, this is where I was trying to explain early on that I believe we see the first evidence of the rapture. And I've had conversations with people since then that they, they felt like, you know, look, I see what you're saying, but I'm just not convinced based on what you're showing me that that means that's where the rapture is. And that's okay. I mean, we can walk out of here. We don't have to. We can agree to disagree. 
But what I want to remind you of is this. In Revelation chapter 4, verse 1, where most pre-tribulation teachers and believers live, is that in Revelation 4, verse 1, it says, After these things, I, talking about John, was caught up in the Spirit. Okay? On, and I was caught up in the Spirit, and I saw, and he saw the 24 elders dressed in white robes. Now, first of all, I've made this point already, but I'm going to make it again. He was caught up in the spirit. He was not caught up bodily. The rapture of the church is synonymous with the resurrection. Okay, and the resurrection entails a bodily resurrection, not a spirit resurrection. Number two, he only saw 24 clothed in white robes. Okay, what I want you to know right here is, is that we're seeing a multitude. After this, I beheld, lo, a great multitude. Now, again, this is happening after seal six, between seal six, and seal seven, all right, is when this happens. Because again, we haven't gotten to seal seven yet. When we get to seal seven, which doesn't take place till later on, like around chapter eight, seal seven, then trumpet one. And with time, we're going to get into the vials. And I'm trying to tell you that seal, seal seven, trumpet one, and vial one are all happening around the same time is what I'm trying to tell you. All right, so but right here, we're in the middle of seal six and seal seven. And it's an interlude. Do you remember? It's like a, a time has stopped. We're not continuing down a timeline. I've already made that point. He says, a great multitude, which no man could number of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues stood before the throne and before the Lamb. They were clothed with white robes and palms in their hands and cried with a loud voice saying, salvation to our God, which sits upon the throne and unto the Lamb. And all the angels stood round about the throne and about the elders and the four beasts fell before the throne on their faces and worshiped God, saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be unto our God forever and ever. Amen. And one of the elders answered, saying unto me, What are these which are arrayed in white robes? And where, and where did they come from? And I said unto him, Sir, you know, you're asking me? You're the one, you was here before I got here. You, you ought to know what's going on. And he said to him, These are they which came out of great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. This is another point that we can make. I do not believe that the whole seven years is great tribulation. I believe that that great tribulation is that moment in time. We already calculated it out as 75 days. you got tribulation that starts when the Antichrist signs the covenant with the, with the nation of Israel. And it's a 3.5 year period whenever the Antichrist will sit himself on a throne in the temple. And he will say, I am God and you will worship me. And he's going to try to make everybody take the mark. And we talked about that last week, right? And he's going to demand to be worshipped as God because Satan wants the worship of God. And when he reveals himself, there's going to be a period of time, I believe, a 70, about 75 days based on the number we got out of Daniel chapter 12. 12 of great tribulation. Jesus said that there will be great tribulation, Matthew chapter 24. And if those days were not shortened, that even the elect would be deceived. Now I got to tell you, the elect, some people, there might be an argument about it. There's no argument for me. It describes the saints of God. And let me tell you, it describes those that know the things of God. You and I, would, Lord, help us in, in that time. Shall we be here if, if this interpretation is right? Lord, help us in that great time of great tribulation. There's going to be great deception upon the earth, my friend. Yeah. All right? And, and we don't really have time to get into that right now, but let's just keep on going. What, what do we have here, though? We have a picture in heaven, and what we have is clothed in white robes. We have people from every tongue, tribe, nation, Kindred, and they're wearing white robes. Anytime, if you do a study on the Word of God and you see this concept of white robes, it describes the righteousness. The Bible actually says that the white robes are, are the righteousness of the saints, right? And how did you get righteous? I, you know, this is a basic concept that we teach in this church. How did you get righteous? Is it because you put your money in the bucket? No. 
Y'all, we're all in a bind. There's only one envelope in the bucket. Is it because you came to church tonight? No. Is it because you help out in ministry? No. Is it because you sing in music minute? No, 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 no. It's because Jesus died, amen, and he, he allowed an exchange to take place where he took his righteous life that had no sin and he allowed himself to be hung on the cross as payment for sin, and there was an exchange that took place where he took your guilt upon him, and he gave you his righteousness. Yeah. See, that's why you and I can get to heaven. That's why we'll be clothed in robes of righteousness, not because we did it all right. Mm -hmm. So what are you saying, preacher? I can just live like, like hell on wheels and still, no, no, Paul, Paul was already aware of that. He said that he knew that people were going to say that's what he was preaching. That's not right. Whenever you begin to understand that no matter how bad you've been and all the wrong you've done, that God still loved you enough to send his son to die for you, you will be overwhelmed with gratefulness towards God. The Holy Spirit will begin to speak to your heart and begin to reveal to you, stick it out with me, son. Keep walking with me, son, daughter. Trust me along the way. And he begin to remove that guilt, that burden. You know what I'm talking about? You ever walked around with a burden on your heart? With a, I used to call it a cement sack. Before I got saved, I didn't even know it was there till I went up to the altar and it fell off. And I was like, man, I was toting around a cement sack. And then when I get near to kneel down, but listen, if you're not careful, even after you give your heart to Jesus, you'll pick that cement sack up. You'll start toting it around again. You'll allow the devil to lie to you and tell you that you're guilty. Anyway, these, these multitude are dressed in white robes, which is the righteousness of of the saints, and there's a multitude of them. And I'm just trying to tell you that that's my picture of the rapture. It takes place between seal number six and seal number seven. All right, now let's go to Revelation chapter 14. And let's go ahead and start reading this. And I look, because listen, what I'm trying to tell you is that chapter 14, I believe, is a repetition of chapter seven. I got some slides that are going to say it. I don't mean to be redundant, but in case you don't catch it now, you'll catch it later. Chapter, I believe chapter 14 is a repetition of chapter 7. And what I'm trying to say is, is that I believe that chapter 14 speaks of the 144,000. It also speaks of the rapture. And I believe that it also starts to show us a time frame of wrath. All wrapped up within this particular chapter. And I'm going to try to break it down for you so that you can see what I'm talking about. He said, and I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on the Mount Sion. And with him, 144,000, having his father's name written in their foreheads. All right. So the idea would have to be that this is after this. Is, in other words, the idea would have to be. All right. You got to work with me on this. After they were sealed and looking at the whole scene from another angle. Time frame wise, they were they weren't sealed yet. Then they were sealed. And the reason that I'm saying that is because this is a major point. Wrath has not been poured out yet. You see, and the Lord said, don't let the wrath be poured out until they're sealed. So still the wrath hasn't been poured out and we'll move forward in all of that. OK, so he said it has their father's name written in their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven as the voice of many waters and as the voice of a great thunder. And I heard the voice of harpers harping with their hearts. And they sung, as it were, a new song before the throne and before the four beasts and the elders. And no man could learn that song but the 144,000, which were redeemed from the earth. Now, I want you to see that. I want you to see that word redeemed right there. And I want you to tuck that away. I mean, what does that word mean in your mind, right? When you say, listen, the word redemption, the word redemption means to be bought at a price. That's number one. I mean, I can tell you that right there. Look, to be in the marketplace to do business there, to buy or sell, to purchase, to buy, to redeem. Okay, it's like when you go, if you went, if you went and you gave somebody money for something and you purchased it. So the idea of redemption in the Word of God, especially in New Testament theology, is that Jesus redeemed you with His blood. Amen. You were a sinner. You had a guilt upon your life, and Jesus purchased you back for God when he when he died and whenever his blood was was poured out whenever he died as a sacrifice the wages of sin is death but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ so he redeemed you redemption is that idea but listen 
in, in Ephesians, well, I'm just going to go to it real quick because we can. In Ephesians chapter 1, I believe it's verse 13, it says this. It says, in whom you also trusted after you heard the word of truth. Have you heard the word of truth before? In other words, the gospel. Did somebody tell you the good news of Jesus? Yes, I believe they have. Okay, and, and the gospel of your salvation in whom also after you believe. So when you, you first you got to hear the gospel. That's why we need preachers to preach the truth. That's why we need people like you to witness to other people that are out there. Whenever God opens up the door of opportunity, amen, that you would tell other people the good news of the gospel. And then after they hear it and they believe, look what happens. You get sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. What does that mean? When you get born again, the Holy Spirit comes to live on the inside of your heart. Amen? Which is the earnest or the down payment of our inheritance. Look at this. Until the redemption of the purchased possession. What does that mean? If redemption is describing that Jesus died to purchase me back with his blood, what is this talking about? Because it's saying that I was already saved. I heard the gospel. I believed. I was sealed with the spirit. And it's saying that I, when I was sealed with the spirit, it was the down payment of my inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession. So in other words, there's another redemption that is to come. Good news, good news, Christian. The next redemption that is to come is that you're going to be redeemed from the earth and you're going to receive a glorified body. Hallelujah. Just like Jesus resurrected from the dead, he told Martha, well, one of his sisters, I believe it was Martha, he said, do you believe that Lazarus will rise? She said, yeah, I believe he'll rise in the, in the last day. I believe in the resurrection. Well, he says, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, he will never die. Hallelujah. I got good news for you, my friend. The resurrection is a form of redemption. It's when your old, dead, decaying body in the grave should you go to sleep before the Lord returns. When he comes back to get you, he's going to redeem you from this earth. Amen? Does that make sense? You, he's already paid the down payment. You already belong to him. He's already given a down payment. You, you already got the, 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 the down payment, but guess what? There's more to come. Amen? Praise God. So here we are, and we're talking about the redemption. And it says, these 144,000 which were redeemed from the earth. All right? Now, now, people that believe, some people teach, let me just say this, some people that I respect to teach that these 144,000 have a rapture after the rapture. That these 144,000 are on the earth and that they're witnessing and then at some point in time in the last 3.5 years, God raptures them off the earth. Okay? I'm just telling you. And, and, it's people, and it, there's people that you, that you love that teach that. Okay? And they redeemed, they were, but it says they were redeemed from the earth. Okay, so they, we know that it has to be a rapture because, because again, it's talking about being redeemed from the earth. Y'all with me? Y'all believe me on that? I've already proven the point that does it. These are they which were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are they which follow the Lamb wherever he goes. Now, I personally do not believe, this is just my opinion, I don't believe that this has to be that they never ever had a relationship with a woman, okay? I, that's not what I believe. And, and let me tell you why I believe that. And I could be wrong, but let me tell you why I believe that. Because I've already gone through it with you guys. When we started the teaching on end times, we talked about the spirit of Antichrist. We talked about the spirit of Jezebel. We talked about the spirit of harlotry. We talked about that in depth. I don't know these two different teachings. Yes, ma'am. And this may sound silly, but is it just men? That's what it says. Now, does it mean that? I mean, that's what it says. Uh, you know, what the idea behind it. Um, again. I'm sure a Jehovah Witness woman has no chance. Yeah, there you go. Well, shoot, they were wrong anyway, so that's why we didn't give them any time. Okay. So that's what it says. And, and, and again, one of the things that we got to understand is, is that to the Jewish mindset, everything went through the lineage of the man anyway. All the patriarchy, it was a patriarchal society. But anyway, good question. But are all believers men? Of course not. <laughs> Amen. All right. But what? I, but back to my train of thought. Whenever I talked about Proverb chapter seven, I believe it was 
There was, a, there was a woman that was dressed like a harlot that tried to deceive the young man that was devoid of understanding. And I, when I taught that, I made the point that throughout God's scripture, the spirit of Antichrist is described, and we'll see that when we get to Revelation 17. The spirit of Antichrist is described as a harlot, which is really what Jezebel did. She taught Israel to sin against God, to commit fornication with idols and false gods. That is what the spirit of Antichrist does. It presents itself in a way that's enticing. It presents itself in a way that comes across as beautiful or as something good. But in reality, it is a trap that is set by the enemy to pull and to snare the child of God. Now, I'll give you even further proof. This isn't proof this passage, but I'll give you even further proof that, and, and this is no, in no way, shape, or form trying to condone adultery or trying to condone fornication, but it's a point that I'm trying to make. That when David sinned against God, the word of God said that David is a man after God's own heart. God said that. Now, to the undiscerning eye or heart, he said, well, how could God love a cheater like David? David cheated David cheated, and not only that, he committed murder. And we're not going to go through the whole story. Do you understand that the kings that followed David worshipped false gods? Okay, they committed spiritual adultery. They worshipped false gods. They built altars for gods that demanded child sacrifice. They built altars. They worshipped in the occult. They worshipped Satan. In a, in a certain sense. Does that make sense? All right. So that the point that I'm trying to make, that's my take on this. It may, it may mean literal. I can't prove it, and I don't think you can. But if you can, I want you to. But I don't think you can. All right. So these are they which were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are they which follow the Lamb wherever he goes. These were, look at this. This is one point that I want to make to you tonight about this passage. These were redeemed from among men. We've already talked about the fact that they were redeemed, right? These were redeemed from among men. Okay, but look what it also says. Being the first fruits unto God. So, now check this out. If you believe like some teachers believe, and you believe in a pre-tribulation rapture, and you're, and you're, you're staunch in your stance, and you say, you're not, I'm, I'm, I'm a... I shall not be moved. Just like a tree planted by the water, I shall not be moved. Okay. So the only alternative you have is that there's another rapture of these 144,000 somewhere in the middle of the last 3.5 years. You understand? All right. But what I want you to see is I, the, the problem that I have is this word right here. First fruits. First fruits. And we're going to talk a little bit about the Feast of First Fruits tonight. I know this is a lot of information. Just bear with me. What I want you to know is that the basic meaning of first fruits, in my way that I would see it, is that first fruits are those that rose from the dead first. We're going to show you a rapture scripture that says the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain will go to meet them in the air. How can we call these 144,000 first fruits unto God if they're raptured actually after the rapture. Does, do, do, and you understand what I'm saying? I'm just, trying, I'm just trying to throw this stuff out there so that we'll think about it. And so to me, that, that, that right there doesn't work. All right? So they're first fruits unto God and to the Lamb. And in their mouth was found no guile, for they are without fault before the throne of God. And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them, that dwell on the earth and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people saying with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come and worship. And it hasn't come yet. Okay. But it's come, it's coming. All right. And, and that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of the waters. And there followed another angel saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Now, I don't, I didn't make any slides for this, and I want to keep moving at a pretty good pace because I want to be able to get you out of here before I beat you to death, all right, with too many words. But 
What I want you to understand is this is the same concept when I was talking about the beast not just being a man, which is the Antichrist, but the beast is also a system. I need you to understand that Babylon is not just a literal city or city-state, if you will, that is now modern-day Iraq, but that Babylon is a spiritual city. It's a spiritual entity. You got to understand that because see, many people believe that in order for the, the rapture to take place and, or in order for the last seven year period to take place, literal Babylon has to be rebuilt. I don't believe that. I do believe a temple has to be rebuilt, but I don't believe that, uh, that the literal city of Babylon has to be rebuilt. Saddam Hussein tried to do that. He built the gate of Ishtar, but Saddam Hussein is not anymore and they did not rebuild the city of Babylon. What I'm trying to tell you is that the city of Babylon is a system. It's the occult system. It's all that financial banking, the Federal Reserve Bank, along with the occultic world of false religion and all the religions that have been come together that Lucifer has given birth to, that he's the madam over. And these are all the prostitutes of all these false religions that cast spells upon people's minds and, and not just Buddhism and Hinduism and, and Allahism and all this other isms, not just that, but forms of Protestantism. I think, come on now, because listen, even though the preacher be well-meaning that stand behind the pulpit, if he preaches false doctrine and tells somebody, this is the pathway to victory, and it elevates and puts the mind and the focus on something other than the finished work of Christ, which allows the Holy Spirit to come in and give the victory, he's preaching a lying message that will allow deception to come in, that will allow the believer... The same, a spell, if you will, if I can say it like that, what the Apostle Paul said. He said, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Before your very eyes, Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. This only do I need to know from you. Did you start out in the spirit and now you're going to be made blind of the wrath of her fornication. The point being is, is that here she is again. Spirit of harlotry. Spirit of Jezebel. Spirit of Antichrist. Spirit of Babel. Whatever you want to call it. Causing mankind to cheat on God. Causing man to go in a false way. Alright. The third angel followed them saying with a loud voice. If any man worships the beast in his image. And receives his mark in his forehead or in his hand. The same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God. You think you worried about the wrath? You think you worried about the wine of the wrath of the harlot of Babylon? No, you better be. We better be worried about the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of His indignation, and shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lord. You know, I, I believe this. I don't believe that the mark is here, okay? But I do believe we're going to know it when it is. I believe if we want to know it, we're going to know it. We're going to know it. It's going to be obvious, amen? And listen, I can all I can tell you is don't let the devil whisper in your ear and tell you, oh, no, this is okay. This is just another little thing here. It's going to be all right. No, no, no. The smoke of their torment ascends up forever and ever, and they have no rest day nor night who worship the beast in his image and whoever receives the mark of his Name. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Right blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from here forth. Yes, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works do follow them. And I looked and behold a white cloud. This is now we're getting into some rapture territory here, I believe. We're about to, I got some slides I want to show you. I looked at and behold a white cloud, and upon the cloud one sat like unto the Son of Man. What, what you, what you, who do you think that is? Jesus. Jesus, thank you. Having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. Crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud, thrust in your sickle and reap. For the time has come for, the, for thee to reap the harvest of the earth is right now. What I'm trying to tell you is right here is that this harvest that, that the Son of Man, which is Jesus, knife, something like that, where you cut and you, and you cut the, the harvest out. And what I need you to know is, is that this one right here, because there's another one that's coming that's not the same. There's another one that's the opposite of this. This one right here is that he's, a, he's the Son of Man is about to reap the harvest of the earth. 
I'm trying to tell you that I believe this is a type of, the, this is not a type, this is the rapture. Okay, that he's about to reap the harvest of the earth. Now, if you've been in this church for any length of time, you've heard me teach it at nauseum that without, throughout the whole of Scripture, there is, and y'all need some Zofran? That's a good one. <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. Ad nauseum. Yes, I've taught it so much that you should, you know, hopefully you won't be nauseated. Hopefully it's actually, hopefully it's actually sweet to your belly. That's what it ought to be. It ought to be sweet to your belly. Because even though you hear it over and over again, it's the word of truth. Amen. And the, there's a common theme that runs through the scriptures of seed time and harvest. Seed time and harvest. The word of God is likened to a seed. And when the seed is planted in good fertile soil, it produces a harvest. But we heard in the parable of the sower that almost everything, this world is against the word of God. This, it's like a hostile environment for the seed of God's gospel to grow. I mean, if you think about it, I'm just thinking about it for the first time. I don't think I ever even preached it like this. That when you look at the parable of the sower, everything is hostile against the seed of God's word. This earth is fallen. Amen. The word of God says that the earth would grow thorn and thistle because of the fall of man. The Bible says in Romans 8 that all creation groans and waits for the redemption. There's that word again of the son's of man. Amen. That God's going to one day redeem us from this earth. We're going to receive our glorified bodies. Guess what? The creation says we can't wait. We can't wait till the believers get redeemed from the earth and receive their glorified body. Because guess what? We're going to be glorified too. The, the birds are, are going to not die anymore. The tree is not going to decay anymore. But the whole parable of the sower, if you look at it again through these eyes, everything is hostile to the seed. It's scattered on the wayside. And what happens? The fowl of the air, in which it represents Satan and his, and his fallen angels and demon spirits, they come in and gobble it up. See, you come into the word of the Lord or, or the house of God, you hear the word of the Lord or you witness to someone and they hear the word of the Lord. The enemy's right there. And he's trying to come in, he's trying to snatch the seed of God's word. He's trying to just steal it before it can even get into the word. And then some falls amongst stony ground. Some falls amongst the thorns and the thorns grow and they choke the seed of God's word. You know, there's so many things that are hostile to people becoming true believers and true disciples. What's that? That's their power. Why? That's their power and uh, anointing. Will. Amen. And where it'll stick. Amen. And how many times did the Lord witness to you before you died? Right. And how many times? How many times did the people? And listen, the Word of God by itself is anointed. I mean, I agree with Robert. I know what Robert's story. People do. This one said this. That one said that. That one said that. But it wasn't until it was in the cell with Wade, and I heard, and he would call that the anointed Word of the Lord. Amen. And I, I agree with that. But guess what? Sometimes even the word comes out of me, I can feel the anointing on it more than at other times. But by the grace of the Lord, anytime he opens up the door, I'm going to give it. I'm going to throw the seed out there. Amen. To, and, and believe God. In. So look, but there's coming a day. We went off on a rabbit trail. There's coming a day when he's going to throw in his sickle and he's going to reap because the harvest of the earth is ripe and it's going to be ready to be reaped, all right? And look, and he that sat on the cloud, he thrust in his sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped, rapture. And another angel came out of the temple, which is in heaven, he also having a sharp sickle, and another angel came out from the altar, which had power over fire, and cried with a loud cry to him that had the sharp sickle, saying, thrust in your sharp sickle, and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth, for her grapes are fully ripe. You see, there's a difference. There's a harvest of the earth, and then now there's the grapes of the vine of the earth. See, you're connected to a vine, but it's not supposed to be the vine of the earth. Amen. John chapter 15 says that he's the vine, you're the branch. You're supposed to be connected to Jesus. And whenever he says, and apart from me, you can do nothing. But if you will tarry, if you will live in this place where that branch you've been grafted in, well, we could sit here and we could preach on that. That's some good stuff. How God grafts in even the Gentiles, a wild branch. But yet at the same time, it takes and it starts to bear fruit, the fruit of the spirit. Amen. But look, you're not supposed to be part of the earth anymore. I mean, I could preach on that for the next 20 minutes. You're not supposed to be part of the world. 
Amen. Once you get saved and the Spirit of God comes to live on the inside of you, if you'll listen, He's going to contend with you. He's going to change the music you that you ain't going to be comfortable listening to. The, oh, but but I don't feel convicted, preacher. I, I don't feel convicted. I'm, and I'm listen. I'm not picking on anybody in here. If you feel weird, it's because the Holy Spirit's trying to make you feel weird. I'm telling you things that I've been through as a believer. Okay, you sit. You can listen to whatever you want, dude. Chick, you got a free will that was given to you by God. But I'm trying to make a point. If you turn on the radio and you start surfing the channel and they got some song on there that's like, you know, Oh, Lord, yeah. It's singing about Satan. Satan laughing spreads his wings. Oh, Lord, yeah. And everybody like, ha, ah, and all the demons cackling. All that. You think that's giving glory to God? No. No, that's not giving glory to God. And you over there like, boom, boom, boom. Oh, yeah, you got your little beat going on. But you like, if you don't realize it, you glorifying the enemy. You need to, can you edit that? <laughs> you know, Preacher sings Ozzy Osbourne with Black Sabbath. No, I'm not trying to. Listen, that's just one example. The music industry is full of that stuff. We, we, we had that. Well, I had one of them G. Craig Lewis videos. We got G. Craig Lewis videos. We can give them out, you know. I mean, at Robert's got some, I got some. And he was literally preaching in a church somewhere. And he started, I, and I don't think it was staged. I think it was real. Because I believe in that man's ministry. He started preaching. He said, some of you people snuggling up with Kanye West and Jay-Z at night. Y'all listening to that when y'all lay in y'all's bed. And y'all inviting demon spirits into your life and into your house. And that girl went to shaking, dude. And she fell out that chair and she was flopping. That's just a devil. Go ahead and cast that devil out. They manifest themselves all the time when I start talking about all of them. So I'm just letting you know that that whole thing is backed up by the enemy. And the enemy Amen. will try to steal from you. You are no longer part of the vine of the earth. If you've been born again and saved, the Holy Spirit lives on the inside of you. You ain't supposed to be part of all that. that I, that's, I'm telling you the truth. Amen. You may not be there yet. And that's okay. You don't have to get there when I tell you to get there. You just need to get there when he tells you to get there. But I'm trying to tell you the truth. That's one of the things I'm trying to do. I'm trying to not dilute it. I'm just trying to give it to you so that we can just hurry up and give it to you so that you can deal with it. Amen. And the angel thrust the sickle into the earth and gathered the vine of the earth. This is how you know the difference between the rapture and the, ra and the wrath. Look. And he gathered the vine of the earth. He cast it into the great wine press of the wrath of God. That's how you know the difference between the two. That's how you know the first one was the rapture because the second one is the wrath. And the wine press was trod without the city, and blood came out of the wine press, even until the horse bridles by the space of a thousand and six hundred furlongs. Okay, I've already kept you so long. I'm going to try to do my best to not overdo this, okay? <laughs> I know, it's like, yeah, whatever. So look, I already said this, repetition between chapter six and eight, okay? And it's repeating tribulation, rapture, wrath, and then in chapters 13 through 16, tribulation, Rapture, wrath, right? All right. It compares 7 to 14. An interlude, time stands still. We already talked about that. Both of them talked about the 144,000. Both of them talked about the rapture. This 144,000, I said it the first time, I believe that they're in heaven being sealed. Amen? And how did I say that? Because the angel ascended. He came up. He didn't descend. The angels... Typically, you would say that they're, they're at least in the heavenly realm. Had they been on earth and he was going to seal them on earth, I would think he would have descended. No, they were in heaven at the time. They were sealed, right? I mean, it's obvious. That's what it seems like to me. I saw another angel ascending from the east, okay? In the Old Testament, I believe that they're Old Testament saints that died and now they have their glorified bodies after the rapture. Look, here's the scripture out of... 1 Thessalonians 4.16. I said it the first time I taught it, I believe, and I'm going to say it again. This is the one scripture we have in the whole of the word of God that literally and specifically, explicitly says that there is a rapture of the church. Right. Period. Done deal. You can't tell me there's not a rapture. Either that or the whole word of God is not real and we just soon go home. No, I'm telling you, the word of God is real. You can hold to it. 
God says it right here. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. That's the part I want you to see. Then we who are alive and remain will go to meet them in the air, and there we shall be with the Lord forevermore, ever in the presence of God. Amen? So, But, the, but listen, the dead in Christ will rise first. And I wanted you to see the scripture again. I highlighted it. They were redeemed from among men. They were the first fruits of God into the Lamb. Now, I went ahead and I, I'm probably trying to bite off way more than I can chew. But I'm just going to go ahead. We're going to quickly talk about this. And, and this is just one of those repetitious moments where it's going to get deep inside of your heart. The Levitical feasts. What are you even talking about, preacher? The book of Leviticus. What is it? It's the third book. Third book of the Bible, right? You got it. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Third book of the Bible, Leviticus. God's about to, God's delivering his people out of Egyptian bondage. I remember the story of the Passover and how the children of Israel were bonded, slaves in Egypt. God said, now they've been wandering the wilderness. God gives them the, how to build the tabernacle, how to do the offerings. And he says, listen, I'm about to bring you into the promised land. And when I bring you into the promised land, I got some feasts that I want you to keep for me. He says, he said, he says it right here, concerning the feast of the Lord, which you shall proclaim to be holy convocations, even these are my feasts. I don't ever want you to stop them. All right. They still got Jewish people today that are keeping these feasts. Now, I got to tell you, I don't know if you ever saw the, the passion of the Christ. And you can listen. There's a lot. People have a lot of opinions about the passion of the Christ. You can like it. You don't have to like it. You can say that they put too much Catholic Catholicism in it. All I know is there was a couple of moments in that movie that shook me. Okay, yeah. like one of my daughters says, I was shook it. Okay, and one of the moments when I was shook it was in the beginning of that of that movie after he had been already betrayed, and it was Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and she says it. Oh, it was so good. I feel the Holy Spirit already. He, she says, why is this light, this night like no other? And she said, because we once were slaves and now we're free. <laughs> See, if you read the Bible like we were all supposed to read the Bible and we studied it, you would know God said, you're going to keep this Passover every year to the point where one day your son is going to say, Daddy, why do we keep doing this? Why do we keep killing that little lamb? Every time I get attached to that lamb and start to call it by name, you go and you pull it out and you slice its throat and you bleed it of, bleed it of its blood. And you kept, why do we do that? Because we once were slaves, son. And God delivered us out from under the hand of Pharaoh with a mighty hand. You're supposed to be that excited about what God did for you in salvation because you see, what I got to tell you is this, Jesus died on the path. That's what that whole story is about. That's why whenever he wrote that into that movie, and she says, why is this night? She's saying to Mary, Mary Magdalene saying to Mary, the mother of Jesus, why is this night like no other? And while they're betraying Jesus, they don't even know this is going on yet. While they're betraying Jesus, Mary, the mother of Jesus says, because we once were slaves. I'm just saying, I know it's Hollywood, but I'm trying to say simultaneously. They're remembering the Passover. And Jesus, Paul said, he is our Passover. He was crucified for us. Jesus was crucified at the Passover. He is the fulfillment of the Passover lamb. That's one of the feasts, all right? The 14th day of the Lord's month of the first month is the Lord's Passover. Leviticus 23, 5. 15th day of the same month is the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Unleavened Bread. you know what leaven is? One time I had a conversation with a youth pastor. And I said, dude, you got leaven in your lump. You over here, you're pre you got, you know, turn the lights down. You got strobe lights. You over here getting ready to start stamping people's hands. You turn this thing into a club. You got leaven in, in your gospel. What, what is leaven? I said, you need to quit reading the message Bible and you'd know. I didn't tell them that. But look, they didn't even know what leaven was. Leaven is yeast. What is yeast? Yeast is a type of sin. 
See, whenever you put a pinch of yeast in a dough of, in a, in a batch of dough, what does it do? It takes over. See, you think you're going to nibble on a little bit of sin, my friend? No. It will always take you further than you want to go. It will always keep you longer than what you want to stay. You take a little bit of a nibble and you put a little bit of a pinch of yeast up in a batch of dough. It takes over. It starts to spread. Right? It reproduces. Yeast is like an organism and it reproduces and it this byproduct is carbon dioxide and it causes that dough to fluff up. That's what sin does when you let a little bit in. That's what false doctrine does. When you let a little bit of false doctrine in, listen, as soon as you're watching that preacher, but I like him, man. He makes me he makes me feel all good on the inside. If you hear him say something that you know is not of the Lord, you need to move on past that garbage. You need to get that out of your life. Jesus had no sin. See, it wasn't going to do Gaudi no good to die for your sin because guess what? You, you, you ain't going to make it no way if Gaudi has to die on the cross because Gaudi's a sinner just like I'm a sinner, just like you're a sinner. You can't die for your own sin. Gaudi can't die for our sin. God the Father sent Jesus, the sinless one, to die on the cross so that he could pay the penalty for your sin and my sin. Amen? He was the sinless one. What I'm trying to show you is in these feasts that are listed in Leviticus 23, it's showing us in the first month, Listen, God's so, God's so awesome. I don't know if cool is the right adjective to use. God, that might be irreverent. God's so awesome. And the, he's a, yes, he's amazing. And, and, and he's altogether wonderful. Amen. In the first month of the Jewish year, all four of these feasts were fulfilled the first time Jesus came. <laughs> And then I'm not even going to talk to you about the last three, but they show up in the seventh month of the Jewish calendar. The number seven is fulfillment, completion. On the seventh day, God rested. It, it just doesn't get any better than that. So what I'm trying to say is, in these first four, Jesus was the Passover. You see that right there? He fulfilled that one, Leviticus 23, 5. Paul said he's our Passover lamb. He was crucified on Passover. He was unleavened bread. He had no sin. All right, I wish I had more time to talk about unleavened, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, but I don't. Here's the next one. Bring a sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest. That's what we're really talking about right now is first fruits, right? Because we're talking about those 144,000 that are redeemed and the first fruits unto God. That's how we ended up over here, if you'll remember right. <coughs> he says, bring a sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest. Now, listen, here's the next part to that. He shall wave the sheaf before the Lord for you to be accepted on the day after the Sabbath. Now, what I want you to know is, I know I've talked to you about it before, but I'm going to talk to you about it again real quick. And those that weren't able to make it tonight, you're going to just understand a little bit better about the Word of God because you sat in this teaching tonight. What is a sheaf, right? Because if I'm on the, and you may already know, but if I don't tell you what a sheaf is, you're like, dude, you done lost me a sheaf. What is a sheaf? I know, I know a sheet. But I don't know a sheaf. Well, a sheaf is like a bundle. It's another way to say a bundle of grain. You got the harvest out there. And listen, the first harvest was the barley harvest. And there's meaning in all of that. But look, the barley harvest. And when you're ready to go harvest it, the first thing that you're to do is you go and you get a sheaf to give to the priest, right? So he'd go out there, he'd grab him, he'd hug it. He'd hug him a big old bundle of grain. And he'd take his own little sickle and he'd cut it. And then he'd go bring it to the priest, and for the feast of first fruits, he would wave it before the Lord. Now, listen, I know I get way too deep into this stuff, but I imagine in my mind the sun, I don't know what time it is, but the sun is maybe coming down, and, and, and the wind's got a nice little gentle breeze, and this grain has all this husk on it, and he done tied this little bundle of grain together, and he holds it up for the feast of first fruits because the Lord said we're going to do it. You gave me the sheep, I'm going to wave it in the air. And all of a sudden, all these little husks start flying off of the grain, and the sun glints on it, and you can see it all floating up in the air. The feast of first fruits is a type of the rapture. Isn't that, isn't that something? I mean, I don't know. Maybe I'm making more out of it than what it should be. But I see all this stuff floating up in the air. And I just don't believe that that would have, I think God did that on purpose. But what I want you to know is this. Look what it says. The Lord for you to be accepted on the day after the Sabbath. So I got you, I got to tell you, I'm not trying to get too deep, but I got to explain it. The Passover itself was a, was a Sabbath day. All right. Jesus wasn't, wasn't crucified on Friday because 
It does. It takes more than three days. He, he was in the tomb for three days and three nights. The Passover never fell on the same day. He, and I don't have, I, I've already calculated it so many times, but more than likely, he probably died. The, 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 at, he died at 3 o'clock, right? He was taken off the cross at 3 o'clock. Or, or before sunset, he was taken off the cross. He died at three, taken off the cross. I'm shooting from the hip here. Died at three, taken off the cross right before six, which is when the next day started. And he was put into the tomb. All right. So the first day of Passover, the year that he was born, would have been a Sabbath day. It wasn't the Sabbath on Sunday. Does that make sense? Y'all still with me? So y'all do know that the Sabbath is the, la is, the, is the seventh day of the week. Y'all know that, right? Okay. But you got to understand too, for these feasts, the Passover itself, the day it landed on, it was a Sabbath. It was considered a special, a high holiday, a Sabbath day. So when Jesus died and, and was taken off the cross before the Sabbath started the night of the Passover. Okay, does that make sense? All right. And then he was put into the tomb... Okay, but then there was another, there was another Sabbath. I said Sabbath is on Sunday. That wasn't right. Y'all was supposed to correct me. Sabbath is on Sabbath. <laughs> All right. So the, but then there's another Sabbath on the Saturday. So Jesus died. Let's just say he died on, I'm using Wednesday, but it gets kind of complicated. It's probably Thursday, Wednesday or Thursday. He dies on one of those days. All right. He's put into the tomb. All right. And then the Sabbath, which is the Saturday comes. All right. But what this scripture is saying right here is this. Is that the Feast of first fruits in that same week as the Passover, as unleavened bread, there's another Sabbath after the first Sabbath. And he says, on, this, on the day after the Sabbath, you're going you're gonna to the, the, wave the sheaf of grain. You, you, you're following with me. Okay, so you had the Passover. Because that, look, this is 1,450 years before Jesus is born, whenever God tells him to. So I just want you to wrap your brain around that. 14, about 1,450 years before Jesus is even born on the earth, God institutes these feasts and says you will do them every year. And the first one on the 14th day of the month is the Passover. Jesus died on the Passover. On the 15th day begins the unleavened bread. Jesus is unleavened bread because he had no sin in him. Okay, then the next one is the Feast of first fruits, which takes place the day after the Sabbath, after the Passover. So what are you trying to say? What I'm trying to say is Jesus rose on the day after the Sabbath that took place after the Passover. You can't make this stuff up. Jesus died on Passover and he rose from the dead on the feast of first fruits. And then if you go back, it says, and you shall count for yourselves from the day after that Sabbath, when Jesus rose from the dead, 40, what does it say? Seven complete Sabbaths, which is 49 days. And on the 50th day, what is that? Pentecost. 50 days later, after Jesus rose from the dead, in the upper room was the Feast of Pentecost, and the Holy Ghost fell on the church, and they began to speak with other tongues. Hallelujah. What I'm trying to tell you is, is that in these feasts, God had pre-written the plan of God. We don't have time to go into the last three because they're definitely connected to Jesus coming back the second time. But what I want you to know is this. Is that how beautiful is that? How beautiful is that? But what I want you to see is the feast of first fruits is a type of the resurrection. Jesus is the first fruits unto God. But when it's talking about these 144,000, it's, I believe what it's telling us is, is that they were dead, they were in the ground, and it says in, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 that with the shout of God, with the shout of the archangel, the trumpet of God, the dead in Christ shall rise first, and we who are alive and remain will go to meet them in the air. Point being is that they were the first fruits, they were redeemed from the earth, they were redeemed from among men, they were first fruits unto God. You get the point? I think I, I think y'all y'all got it for the most part. Exactly. And we'll have to go over. It, it could have been the first fruit of the tribulation. Why would it be the first fruits of the tribulation? No, I guess the question. I guess the question. I guess yeah, the I mean, I don't see why it would be the first fruits of the tribulation. I mean, it, we already we're already being told that people are are dying. I mean, I mean, how many raptures are there? I mean, if you believe in more than one rapture, I guess. Yeah, I mean, I guess, is it possible? I'm not going to say it's impossible, but I don't believe that to be the case. All right. So he says, Lo, I looked, and a lamb stood on Mount Zion with him 144,000, having his father's name 
written in their foreheads. I don't really want to get into it, but the book of Hebrews talks about a Mount Zion in heaven. Okay, there's a Mount Zion literally in Jerusalem, but, there, but Hebrews also talks about a Mount Zion in heaven. All right. These are they, and, and we've already talked about this. They were redeemed from among men. They were the first fruits unto God in the land. And I, and I wanted you to know that chapter 14 has more in common than just chapter 7. And we've already discussed it. But it says, look, son of man, he had a golden crown and a sharp sickle. This is the scriptures. He says, thrust in your sickle for the time has come for you to reap the harvest of the earth. He says the earth was reaped. Okay, we said that that was a type of, the, that was the rapture, right? And then it says right here, and another angel came out of the temple, which is in heaven. He also having a sharp sickle. Now, let me, let me just say this too. Yeah, so I mean, that's, that's basically what, what God, the point that God is trying to make is. So if that's right, if what you're saying is right, then that means that God is going to pull the 144,000 witnesses out somewhere in the middle of the last three and a half years. Yeah. That's basically what that means. And then the question is, will there still be witnesses on the earth at that point in time? Maybe other people got saved, but that, that, that's what has to happen if, if that's the case, all right? And then he, the, another angel has a sharp sickle and he, Thrust in your sickle for the clusters of the vine of the earth. Her grapes are fully ripe. These are those that are connected to the earth. We already said it. There's a distinction between the harvest of the earth and the clusters of the vine of the earth. Right? The rapture versus the wrath. And it says, gather the vine of the earth and cast it into the great wine press of the wrath of God. All right? And so... Again, with the way that I'm seeing the book of Revelation, just to go back to what Gaudi, the question Gaudi asked, is, and there's a lot that you have to understand a lot about the book of Revelation even for this to make sense. But if like we, made a, we made a distinction between tribulation and the wrath of God, okay? And we made a distinction, or at least, at least in my mind and in my heart, there's a difference. And that tribulation even though we were all, always told it i don't believe that tribulation is the whole seven years yes there's going to be tribulation in the seven years but there's difference between tribulation and wrath and now we're at the point where he says the wrath is beginning and the people of god have no reason to be here at that point in time and so you know basically he for, for that to happen, there would have had to have been, this is the second rapture, but the wrath is just now being poured out, is what's going on here. So, essentially, again, I know I'm kind of talking out, you know, and it's probably not a good idea to do that, but I'm just trying to make a point that in order, in order for that to happen, that the, uh, the, the wrath of God is, well, I'm, it's, it's too hard to try to think while I'm up here. <laughs> I just got to let you talk, okay? And then, then why the beast will have power to overcome the Christians? What's that? The beast will have power to overcome the Christians. Yeah, but that's what I'm trying to say, though, is that Christians aren't going to be here for the wrath of God. Right. And the whole point to this, there's no reason for a Christian to be here for the wrath of God, and that's what right. we're trying to delineate between tribulation, which is the first seals, versus the, the first trumpet, okay, and that, that's what starts the wrath. But Jesus took our wrath, and Paul said we're not appointed unto wrath. So there's no reason for Christians to be here for the wrath of God. Okay? All right. So again, I said 14 is explaining all over again what chapter 7 said. All right. So I'm just going to kind of move on. We've already well, done. What is going to be people saved in the tribulation? Huh? What's that? People going to be saved in the I believe that. Yes. I, I personally do. I mean, I can't prove it, but I believe that it's probably going to be different. Let's just close with this. I had some other things. We'll start it off next time. But just to answer the question. The question was, people will be saved in the tribulation. Some people don't believe that. I personally do believe that. 
I do believe that maybe it's going to be different than what it is now in the New Testament age. Once the church goes away, once the church is raptured, I believe there's going to be a change to the way that the Holy Spirit moves on the earth. Okay, that's just my personal opinion. I can't. I don't. I'm not saying that I can prove that. You mean during the last three and a half. Years? Yes, during the last three and a half years, I believe right. it'll be more similar to the way it was in the Old Testament. The time of the tribulation reminds me of the scripture where it says, let us work while it is day, for the night comes That's and no it. man can work. It's going to be hard to share the gospel yeah. and, and have a lot yeah. of conversions, but yeah. it doesn't mean that yes. we can't. And I believe it'll be, I believe it's going to be a little bit more like it was in the Old Testament. I believe there's going to be a change to the Holy Spirit and not so much like, more like the way that people believed looking forward to Jesus and they're going to be choosing whose side that they're going to be on. They're either going to be on the side of the Lord or they're going to be on the other side. Um, but I'm just not positive that people are going to be filled and sealed with the Holy Spirit during that time frame. Kind of like it was in the Old Testament, if that makes sense. Because, because there's going to be a change. Because the church is going to be gone and the Holy Spirit doesn't mean the Holy Spirit's going to be gone. But I believe that the Holy Spirit will be working with people differently. Yes, sir. So like if they die during that time, they just die and go to heaven. There isn't no other rapture where they just all. Yeah, there's no there's no other rapture, but that, out, yeah, right? but but in the end, uh, in the end, but but, but there's a you know there's a second re resurrection, and we'd have to get into that. You like know what I'm they saying? Saved during that time, and they pass away, and they die they during that heaven. time. Yeah, I don't think it's like he just comes back again and just brings. Yeah, and that's a good question. And I, I'm gonna be honest with you. I'm trying to think in my head, and I don't. There may be information in Revelation 20, 21 that'll answer that question for us. And when we get there, I do know that there's gonna be there's gonna be the throne. There's gonna be a judgment seat of Christ for believers, but then there's gonna be a great white throne judgment for unbelievers. But that doesn't take place till a thousand years are over. Um, and the and the great white throne judgment takes place. But I do believe that there will be people that make it through that don't die and they won't even have glorified bodies. But that's a that's a good question. You know, what happens at, at the end after the battle of Armageddon when Jesus comes back? Do do people come up out the grave and yet they, at the same time they don't have glorified bodies? This is all speculation because you can't I don't think that we can prove it from the scripture. There's certain things, like for instance, I believe that there's going to be people that make it through the last three and a half years that won't die. Maybe some people like you're saying that, that said, no, I'm not going to take this mark and are going to die for God. And that they're going to be buried in the ground, their body will still decay. And then, but whenever Jesus comes back in the, and for the battle of Armageddon, those people that didn't die during the millennial reign of Christ, it says that they're going to eat from the, it talks about the tree of life again. And so I believe personally that, uh, you know, that through that thousand year reign of Jesus, that people are going to be multiplying on the earth. And um, and I believe that there will be differing levels. I believe that there's going to be all uh, all kinds of um, different levels of, of being. You'll have angels, you'll have. You know, there you'll have us with glorified bodies. You'll have human beings without glorified bodies. And I believe the gospel will still be preached because the Bible says that Satan has to be loosed for a short period of time to deceive the nation. So people are still going to have to ultimately make a decision for Jesus. You know, some difference because it says we're going to come back and rule. Yeah, rule and reign over Christ. Yeah, so. So that, that is a good question. I don't know that we're ever going to find an answer to that particular one, but if it's there, I believe that some of that's going to be in Revelation 20. Amen. Well, the rapture, many, many churches are going to be left behind, obvious. Yeah. Many yeah. Churches, and so when, when the Antichrist is gone, we're going to say, amen, I, I messed up. Yeah. Well, and, that, and that's a good point that, that Gaudi's making. That's one of the reasons why you have seen... Through the years, if you've been here, I've tried to point out false doctrine and I've tried to point. Some people don't like that. They call that touching the anointed of God. And what I'm what I'm trying to say is, is that that there's a lot of false teachers out there, a lot of false doctrine yep. out there. And the problem that you have is you have big time ministries, even people like Kenneth Copeland. And I mean, you can find this and I'm not ashamed. I'll say it like it needs to be said. You can find a video of Kenneth Copeland after the pope became Pope and he like spoke to the whole to the whole congregation and they had the Pope on Skype and they were saying to him, you know, listen, we're with you, 
we want to we want to work with you and this congregation right here doesn't represent just regular people this is a building full of pastors who who are overseers over multiple people and we're we're, we're here with you and what i'm trying to say is is that there's a lot that can be said about Catholicism and how it's not interconnected to the truth of apostolic Christianity. I mean, listen, I, we done showed so many pictures through the, you know, through the, but not only that, you take people like the Pope and, and there's actually things talking about a right now, a one world religion, like they're having a conference for it. Yeah. And he talks about Chrislam and Rick Warren been talking about Chrislam for six years. And what I'm trying to say is, is that people are just blindly following these people. And, you know, Rick Warren says, oh, we can work with the Muslim side by side as we try to bring in peace <clears throat> on earth. Well, hold on a second. They don't even believe in the same Jesus we believe That's in. Right. What, what kind of peace are you talking about? Because, see, there's going to be a fake peace that comes before the real peace. And, and there's a lot of people that are waiting for a Messiah to return. But before Jesus comes, there's going to be a false Christ. And he's going to work with miracles. And he's going to work with wonders and signs and it's going to cause great confusion and deception on the face of the earth. So that's why we've gone through the times and called people out. And we've said various things because of what he's talking about. It's, it's a word called ecumenicalism, where it's like everybody's becoming one. What you got to understand is that's not good. No. It's not good for everybody to become one. God wants people to be distinct. He wants it. Paul said this, I would that we'd all speak the same thing. He wants everybody to preach the gospel for the way it's written. But 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 he doesn't want everybody to be. You understand what I'm saying? It's like, it's like that's like the tower going backwards into the Tower of Babel, trying to bring it all together in one one world religion, one one language, one government, one you know. So that's what that's what that's all about. And, and you need to be aware of that because I believe that we're seeing it manifest like before our very eyes and so there's a lot of false preachers and teachers on television you can flip through the channels let, let me just say this it's not that everybody that's on tv that's popular and has churches filled with thousands and thousands and thousands of people are automatically not preaching the truth because they have all these people in their churches that's not what the litmus test is but it's more than likely going to be that people are going to be drawn to that because i believe that there's a demonic anointing on Yep. Does that make sense what I'm saying? You ever heard yep. of a demonic anointing? Like in other words, the masses, the crowds feel something tintillating their flesh. It's like, oh, it makes me feel good. I want more of this. And it tells them what they want to hear and what they want to feel. And so they keep coming back for more. All right. Praise God. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for your word, Lord. We pray that your Holy Spirit would be living on the inside of us and leading and guiding us in all truth, O oh Lord God, that you would show us your ways. Lord, that we would not be deceived, Lord, in these last days. Lord, God, help us to be able to see, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.